in Phyrexia. A hellish faction of sharp metal and corrupted flesh, led by Elish Norn, mother of machines, has for years slowly gathered strength, information, and numbers to unleash the culminated might of their dark machinations. With the release of March of the Machines set, we learn their ultimate goal is no less than the invasion and corruption of every plane in the multiverse, until all are united as one under the perfect vision of Phyrexian completion. It's a grand and tragic tale, which I cover deeply in other videos linked in the description. With so many planes, so many races and civilizations fighting for survival in this all-consuming conflict, it can be daunting for a new and even seasoned magic player to sort through the various theaters of war. So in a two-part series, we'll briefly discuss the settings and characteristics of each plane besieged by new Phyrexia, from obscure to omnipresent, in hopes of shedding light on the great worlds of the blind eternities, whose very fates hang on the edge of oblivion. This video is part two in our series with a focus on the greater planes of the multiverse, those of significance on the grandest stage. Check the link below for part one if you haven't seen it already. All right, let's dive in. The storied plane of Dominaria is one of myths and legends, the setting for a majority of the sets and plotlines of Magic the Gathering's earliest years. It's acted as centerpiece, fulcrum, and flashpoint for the most significant events in history. A large plane compared to others, Dominaria has multiple continents, each with their own unique creatures, cultures, and civilizations. Dominaria is a plane accustomed to apocalypse and one deeply connected to Phyrexia. Over its history, it has been witness to destruction and atrocity, first in the ancient past during the Elder Dragon Wars. It suffered greatly with the rise of Thran physician Yagmoth and subsequent fall of the Thran Empire. Yagmoth's discovery and use of the artificial plane of Phyrexia to pursue grand designs in eugenics, modification of flesh, and ultimately a reach towards godhood, not only linked the plane of Phyrexia to Dominaria, but spawned the first generations of Phyrexians in the central ideal held by all. Progression towards perfection. Thousands of years later, Dominaria acted as setting for the internecine conflict between the artificer brothers Urza and Mishra, known as the Brothers' War. At first a struggle of pride and fraternal competition, the conflict was manipulated and inflamed by Yagmoth through his disciple Gix and Phyrexian agents planted throughout the plain. Their role? To prepare Dominaria for invasion and remove the brothers by any means necessary. The culmination of this conflict was the Battle of Argoth, which ended in the infamous activation of the Golgothian Silex, shattering the continent of Teresier, igniting Urza's Planeswalker Spark, and plunging Dominaria into a grim ice age. For the next several centuries, Urza's personal battle against Yagmoth and the Phyrexians would play out across the multiverse, as each sought to brutally end another. The conflict between Planeswalker and the Dark God reached a crescendo with Phyrexians' invasion of Dominaria which saw the artificial plane of wrath and staging ground for Phyrexia's armies metaphysically overlaid atop Dominaria, allowing for the passage of hundreds of thousands of Phyrexian abominations. War with Phyrexia left Dominaria in tatters, saw the sealing away of Zalfir from the time stream, cut down the lives of millions, and ended with the death of both Urza and Yagmoth. Centuries later, and the scars of Phyrexian invasion linger in the mines and landscape of Dominaria, but many of the survivors' descendants have forgotten the abject horror of Phyrexia. This left them hopelessly unaware of the pernicious infiltration of new Phyrexian agents in the current day, who, with oversight given by the Black-Aligned Praetor Shieldred, have corrupted and completed thousands of Dominaria inhabitants into sleeper agents of Phyrexia. The sleepers spied on, disoriented, and sabotaged Dominaria's defenses to allow for a second invasion of the plane, this time headed not by Yagmoth, but by Elish Norn as the mother of machines. With the invasion of Dominaria by New Phyrexia, the plane once more girds itself against external interplanar threat. But hardened by past conflicts and devastations, Dominaria is not so easily defeated. Its inhabitants have risen up to form a new coalition of united purpose in the face of Phyrexian threat. They've taken up the banners and the battle cries of their ancestors and are prepared to charge into war once more against the vile and mechanical forces so intent on conquering their homeland. Dominaria's conviction is felt in the flavor text of Sarah Faithkeeper. I was there when Phyrexia doomed Sarah's realm with a single touch. 
I was there when Yawgmoth tried and failed to conquer Dominaria, and I will still be here when Elish Norn lies dead. The Lost Nation of Zalfir exists in a pocket dimension beyond the reach of space and time due to the temporal phasing unleashed by Teferi during the initial Phyrexian invasion. Teferi long lamented the loss of his home nation to the time stream, but with the rifts unleashed across the multiverse and the nature of the blind eternities in flux from Elish Norn's use of Realmbreaker, Zalfir has once again returned from beyond the void. This is a proud nation of knights who ride noble beasts into battle of warriors ancient to the standards of today, but possessed of impressive martial and mystical might. Their numbers prove critical in leading the counterattack on New Phyrexia, which we see in cards like Inspired Charge and Invasion of New Phyrexia. Their ranks of armored knights fight with valorous honor under the leadership of Sadar Jabari. Arcavios was born of a violent maelstrom as two previously separate planes came violently crashing together. The tumultuous mixing of their mana ley lines created unique singularities of two interwoven colors of mana, called snarls. The energies within these snarls soon manifested in the elder dragons of Arcavios, each representing a beautiful dichotomy of two opposing colors. Magic permeates Arcavios, and its inhabitants are more innately attuned to spellcraft. As civilizations developed, the Elder Dragon saw that only through careful practice study could the potent energies within Magecraft be safely unlocked for the masses, and so founded Strixhaven University as the premier location for tutelage in this field. Strixhaven is divided into five colleges, each led by an Elder Dragon, and each embracing a combination of two opposed colors of mana. At the center of the campus stands the conspicuous Biblioplex, a grand archive of texts and tomes purported to contain all the known spells of the entire multiverse. Students of Tanazir Quandrix see the mathematical perfection found in nature and use organic beauty to craft, experiment, and develop new ways of thinking about the world, lending them to blue and green mana. In the flavor text of Growth Spiral, we hear their philosophy. I've gleaned greater insight from the spiraling of a single fern than I have from all the books I've ever read. Members in blue and red aligned Galazeth Prismaris College study the elemental arts, stunning visual performances, expertly crafted musical scores, and passionate displays of explosive emotion are hallmark of the Prismari, which we hear in the flavor text of Prismari Campus that reads, Mage students who see spellcraft as the highest form of expression choose Prismari the College of Elemental Arts. Shadrick Silverquill presides over the black and white aligned College of Oration, Wit, Style, and Elocution. These poets and writers craft scathing invectives, conjure mystically charged arguments, slander opponents, and maintain a countenance of superiority in intellect, fashion, and poise. They wield magic that enlivens the ink with which they write, and view pomp as important as substance as seen in the art and flavor text of Silverquill Apprentice. She had spoken the words a hundred times, but under the spotlight, in front of everyone, something new emerged, and the crowd went wild. Those drawn to history, those with a passion for excavation and discovery, are drawn to the red and white aligned college founded by Velimachus Lorehold. Students of this school see the past as a significant connection to the present and a potential means for divining the future. They hold ancient relics and buried ruins in high esteem, using brush, tools, and magic to blow away the dust of centuries to better understand those that came before. The flavor text of Lorehold Pledge Mage grants insight into their philosophy and states, The weight of history can empower you or it can crush you. It's your choice. Finally, the black and green aligned College of Essence Studies is guided by enigmatic Belladros Witherbloom. These students view life as inseparable from death and see how each continue the constant rotation of natural life. Their distinguished herbalists craft invigorating or debilitating drafts, and as the flavor text of Rush Rebirth states, Witherbloom students learn to see death not as tragedy, but as opportunity. With the invasion of Elish Norn's machine hosts, the students of Strixhaven stand united in a bitter contest for survival as they sling spells and conjure magic in the university's defense. The illustration and flavor text of the card Phyrexian Censor 
shows us that Norn is interested in the Biblioplex to both acquire knowledge for her faction and destroy those texts of heretical blasphemy so out of tune with the Argent teachings of Phyrexia. It reads, Quintorius muffled a sob as he watched the thing that was once Professor Pitnick confiscate yet another priceless historical tome. The card's final flourish and tenured oil caster highlight Phyrexia's initial success in converting, corrupting, or killing the leadership of Strixhaven and its esteemed professors. But on the reverse side of Invasion of Arcavios, we see the students across all five colleges gather together and call on arcane wisdom of ages past to steal their resolve and fight new Phyrexians in Invocation of the Founders. Desert dunes and life-sustaining oases of Amonkhet have already borne witness to atrocity and subjugation from an external threat beyond the blind eternities. The plane's independence was cowed, its history usurped by the powers of elder dragon Nicol Bolas centuries ago. Bolas took keen interest in two unique marks in Amonkhet's character. First, the curse of wandering, an innate sickness within the plane itself that permeates through all living things. Those that die do not remain so for long. They're brought back as undead, cursed to eternal hunger and listlessness, until all that remains is bone and dust. Second, Amunket contains a blue rocky mineral known as Lazotep that confers mystical properties and when used to coat the undead, allows them to retain much of their skills and instincts in life. For many years, Bolas enthralled the gods of the plain, indoctrinated its people, and manipulated them into creating a society of obedient reverence with the sole purpose of amassing an undead army of Lazotep-plated Eternals, which he used to bring devastation in the War of the Spark. The aftermath of Bolas's schemes desolated the city of Nachtamun, left a majority of the plain's gods slain, and decimated its people softening Amonkhet for invasion by the metallic hosts of new Phyrexia. The Curse of Wandering proved a boon for Phyrexian invaders who quickly corrupted Amonkhet's undead, which we see in the illustration of Unseal the Necropolis, whose flavor text reads, On Amonkhet, Phyrexia found a ready-made army of horrors, waiting for a new master. The plane's susceptibility and the speed at which Phyrexia proliferated is hinted at in the flavor text of Jetaxian Spellstalker which illustrates a converted Kenra warrior and reads, Bolas's methods were crude and inefficient, taking generations to refine the population into a reliable source of combat units. Still, it offers us something of a head start. On the surface, Amonkhet's survival seems dangerously equivocal, but the survivors of Bolas's devastation are hardened, shaped in the crucible of atrocity, and possessed of an indelible conviction to stand and fight. They are led by Hazaret, the red-aligned god of zeal, whose cunning helped turn the tide against Bolas in the War of the Spark. She's looked up to by her mortal flock and instills them with a fiery passion true to her own heart. In the illustration of the battle invasion of Amonkhet, we see Hazaret joined by two other gods in the Scarab God and Locust God. These forgotten gods were first to have been corrupted by Bolas and acted on the side of his faction in the War of the Spark. Whether they've had a change of heart or they're merely protecting their home plane from an external threat is up to speculation, but they've joined Hazaret in spurning new Phyrexia. On the reverse side, we hear of Lazotep's effect on the glistening oil and its ability to mitigate Elish Norn's control over completed beings. The flavor text of Lazotep Convert reads, As the Lazotep covered his body, he heard Norn's voice fade from a deafening clarion to a distant whisper. This could prove most significant in Amonkhet's struggle against the march of the machine. The fairy tale plain of Eldraine is one of chivalric knights, Arthurian legends, dangerous witches, and mesmerizing fair folk that tread through dense, foreboding forests. Eldraine is divided into two large geographic regions, separated by culture, race, and worldview, and often at odds with another. The realm is a land of order and harmony guided by the regnal auspices of the High King and Queen from their throne within Castle Ardenvale. The feudalistic society is predicated on duty, honor, and adventure. It's full of ambitious knights that seek acclaim through completion of quests. These quests challenge skill, belief, and conviction, and are offered in the five courtly regions that constitute the realm, each tied to particular color of mana. 
beyond the civilized society of the realm lies the dangerous and alluring wilds of Eldraine, where the fair folk reign and where magic permeates the lands. The wilds hold untold secrets for those daring members of the realm willing to traverse the enchanted environs. Known to confuse and lead astray, the wilds are difficult to traverse without mentioning the monsters, horrid beasts, and mystifying creatures that dwell within. Fae play tricks on the unsuspecting and cast spells to obfuscate. Witches craft dangerous brews and feed off the life force of those unfortunate to fall into their clutches. Dragons soar over jagged mountain peaks, and the elves of Eldraine embark on massive hunts through winding forests. They stand in opposition of the realm, a land whose people they believe wish to usurp their lands from them. New Phyrexia's invasion of Eldraine was insidious. The courts of the realm were infiltrated by agents who corrupted many courtiers and knights of renown. We see this in the card Order of the Mirror, in which a knight of blue aligned Vantress is transformed into a completed Phyrexian. The flavor text reads, The magic mirror of Vantress showed Katrina a twisted vision of black oil and bloody machines. Even more devastating is the transformation of Ayara, the queen of black aligned Loch Thwain. Her fall from grace is illustrated in the card Ayara Furnace Queen. The land itself is slowly converted into twisting and bizarre landscapes of mutated metal, which we see in the art and flavor text of Thornwood Falls. Deep in Eldraine's wilds, strange eye-like appendages twined among the vines and fairy lights. When Phyrexia initiates plan-wide invasion, the realm's knights are withdrawn from across the lands to defend the courts and the High King. They fight bravely but prove unable to thwart new Phyrexia alone. The fair folk of the wilds realize the danger inherent in Phyrexia. They cast off their prejudices and join the fight against Norn's machine host, which we can see illustrated in the card Wildwood Escort, whose text reads, With Eldraine's human knights called away to defend the courts, lost travelers were surprised to find themselves whisked to safety by the secretive folk of the wilds. And again, we hear of the difficulty of the realm in fighting Phyrexia's advance in the flavor text of Prickle Fairies. When the courts fell, Eldraine's Fae turned from their usual pranks to deadlier tricks. In the wake of invasion, it seems as though the knightly realm is pushed to an existential brink, perhaps allowing for the resurgence of the wilds in the aftermath of the March of the Machine. On the wild plain of Ikoria, Threatening, mutated beasts tear another apart, while sprawling human cities lie within massive redoubts and behind impenetrable palisades, their soldiers ever vigilant for attacks. Akoria is known as the Lair of Behemoths. Here, monsters tread the plains, stalk the forests, and slither through peaty bogs. They're highly adaptive, mutating swiftly and often throughout their lifetime to change with their environment. The monsters of the plain can grow to an incomprehensible scale, and some of their bizarre innate abilities are bestowed onto them by the enigmatic crystal formations that cover Akoria's landscape. The crystals are not well understood, but humans have also tapped into their mystical power to fuel spells and to establish defense systems for protection against behemoth attacks. Akoria's lands are sharply divided by geography, topography, and habitation into five triomes, each surging with three colors of mana, and each unofficially ruled by an apex predator. Savai Triome is a grassy savanna under whose plains lie extensive cavern networks that hide myriad horrors. Cat species prowl the scrubland, which we see in Savai Sabertooth, and Snapdax, apex of the hunt, viciously attacks all who enter its feeding grounds. The marshy frondlands of Indatha are interspersed by a massive helica trees that support all manner of strange and abhorrent life. Nightmare beasts make their nests within the murk, and Nethroi, apex of death, calls from beyond to resurrect creatures of the grave. Rushing rivers that tumble over mountain peaks into cascading waterfalls are commonplace in the Ketria Triome, where elementals soar overhead or integrate themselves within the landscape. Fickle and incomprehensible, Ketria's elementals thrive under the auspices of Aluna, apex of wishes. The primordial muck and wetlands of Zagoth support Akoria's most ancient ecosystem where massive beasts outlive other creatures by centuries. 
The longevity of Zagoth's creatures is apparent in the title of its apex beast, Brokos, Apex of Forever. The fiery landscape and sharp slabs of Raugrin are perfect hunting grounds for Akoria's dinosaur population. These threatening beasts are fiercer than the lands in which they dwell, and armed with razor teeth or spiky tails. Vidrock, apex of thunder, surges through the sky, leaving a path of electrifying destruction in its wake. Ikoria's human population struggles for survival against such behemoths behind guarded walls or atop isolated floating cities. Dranith, the enduring city, stands as a beacon of human solidarity on this trying plane. But not all humans are aggressive towards Ikoria's monsters. Some harbor an innate skill to form magical connections with a monster of the wilds. These bonders become one with a beast, sharing in its urges, its thoughts, and its strength. Bonders and their monsters are persecuted by others and constantly flee for their lives. With the invasion of the multiverse, Phyrexia's presence was first felt through Aquarius crystals, which began oozing glistening oil throughout the plain, highlighted in the ardent flavor text of scoured barons. As oil seeped from Aquarius crystals, strange metallic mutations emerged in monsters all across the plain. The corruption spread quickly, transforming the lands and many creatures into abominations. But on Akoria, mutation and adaptation are quicker. The plane responded to the oil, and Akoria's monsters developed oil vaporizing defenses to neutralize the toxin. With their first attack mitigated, Vornclex's copper host invaded the plane with enormous beasts to rival Akoria's, which we see in the card Copper Host Crusher, whose flavor text reads, Walls built to withstand assaults, even from Akoria's apex monsters, were quickly deemed tactically irrelevant by Vorinclex's forces. In the wake of Phyrexian invasion, the great city of Dranith was obliterated, its people scattered, but the iron focus of Akoria's behemoths united to seize the singular Phyrexian prey. Mutated dinosaurs, implacable beasts, and dangerous elementals all rose to meet the Phyrexian threat and defended Akoria with the ferocity inherent to the plane, succinctly summarized in the flavor text of Rampaging Geoderm. The Phyrexian juggernaut found itself crushed between a rock and a hard place. The Gothic plain of Innistrad is a dark land where festering undead prowl, where blood-crazed vampires stalk their prey, where demons draft infernal contracts to satiate their hunger for souls, and where horrors beyond imagination creep within shadowed thickets. In such a grim world, hope is fragile and light is fleeting. The humans of the plane shield themselves behind the protective magic of Innistrad's angelic host, a font of religious devotion, inspiration, and aspiration that there is something greater than the impenetrable abyss surrounding daily life. Innistrad was once guarded by the Archangel Avacyn, whose strength was absolute and who saved humanity from the clutches of the plane's darker forces striking a tentative equilibrium between good and evil. She, her church, and her ideals were shattered when the Eldrazi titan Emrakul, a being of immense power, was drawn to the plane during the shadows over Innistrad block. Emrakul corrupted the angel, much of her host and many denizens of the plane, transforming them into eldritch abominations. Though Innistrad spared from oblivion, it was utterly devastated and only now are its people rebuilding. Innistrad's noteworthy for the various races that dwell within. Lycanthropic werewolves hunt across the wildlands of the Keswick Forest. Noble vampire families compete in ostentation while slaking their thirst on mortal blood. Liches and necromantic stitchers use death magic pervasive on the plane to resurrect undead and stitch together zombified scabs and spirits of those denied the blessed sleep, yet hold on to the world of the living, haunting moors and hamlets alike. The human population is preyed upon by all these monsters, and several great cities have been born out of necessity for survival. Chief among them are the high city of Thraben, the township of Gavany, and the coastal port of Nephalia. With the invasion of New Phyrexia, glistening oil found purchase amongst Innistrad's grim horrors. Devils and demons welcomed the corrupting influence, gaining power and spreading Phyrexia's truth, which we see on the reverse side of Pyretic Prankster, in which a completed devil spreads the contagion. 
The flavor text reads, When it realized the symbol's true, glorious meaning, it began marking every surface on Innistrad with oil-soaked claws. Innistrad's human and angel contingent found the invading Phyrexians too powerful to confront, but they gained unlikely allies in the very monsters they've avowed to slay. Vuldaren Thrillseeker illustrates the vampiric attack against invaders, while Thalia and the Gitrog monster shows us that the current struggle is one to unite all of Innistrad as the renowned Cathar rides the beast into combat. Innistrad has its own natural defense against Elish Norn, which we hear on the reverse side of Invasion of Innistrad. This shows armies of relentless undead hobbling into the fray and reads, The eerie magic animating Innistrad zombies rendered them immune to Phyresis, making them crucial to the plane's defense. Ixalan, a plane of wonder, of realms uncharted and riches untold, whose bounties can only be hinted, guarded by implacable dinosaurs that prowl primordial jungles. Ixalan is a land of treasure, the great unknown of its landscape begging to be explored by intrepid travelers. In its center lies the fabled golden city of Erazka, purported to hold immeasurable wealth and contain the legendary Immortal Sun. All of Ixalan's races quest for the Immortal Sun, hoping to use its mystical power to gain supremacy over the others. The vampiric conquistadors of the Legion of Dusk originate to the far east on another continent and carry their flag of colonization to conquer Ixalan. The daring pirates of the Brazen Coalition are loosely connected by a code of honor that is just as often ignored as it is followed. They prowl the high seas in search of ever greater profits. The humans of the Sun Empire revere and bond with the dinosaurs that populate Ixalan, turning their natural aggression on would-be interlopers and using them to hunt for the fabled city. Deep within the interior, the River Herald's merfolk work to thwart the progress of the other factions hoping to maintain Araska's secrecy and prevent acquisition of the Immortal Sun. As Phyrexia prepared for Ixalan's invasion, glistening oil seeped into the landscape, the outcome of which we hear in the flavor text of Jungle Hollow. On the surface of Ixalan's vast tar pits, Phyrexian oil glistened and old bones began to stir. The pernicious infection spread to dinosaur and sentient populations alike. Even the elder dinosaur Atali proved unable to resist completion, and we see it transformed into a tali primal sickness. Ixalan's defenders were not without warning. The river heralds, so in tune with the natural world, felt the plane's infection, which we see in the card Deep Root Wayfinder, whose flavor text reads, Her warning raced through the roots and rivers of Ixalan. Prepare for war. In the wake of full-scale invasion, Ixalan's races put their differences aside to stand united against Phyrexian threat. The plane's greatest defenders proved to be the immense primordial dinosaurs, and we see the rampage unleashed by such aggressive creatures in the ardent flavor text of Ravenous Sailback, which shows a dinosaur tearing into Phyrexian war beasts, and reads, Converter beasts were sent to ensnare as many of Ixalan's dinosaurs as possible. Many of them were converted themselves into snacks. Kaladesh is a plane of invention, of genius, of technological wonder and natural inspiration. Thopters flit through vibrant blue skies. Vehicles and constructs assist in the whirrings of the great metropolises. Forges run hot with the fires of creativity, and beauty is found in the lush landscape. Kaladesh owes its technological brilliance to the large reserves of ether that surge across the landscape and suffuse all aspects of life. The ether cycle is studied by prodigious wizards and artificers alike. Its potential tapped to fuel spells, to craft vehicles, and create artificial designs on a grand scale. Its influence can be seen firsthand in the twisting clouds and the spiraling shape many of the trees of the plane assume, showcased in cards like Ether Rock and Windrake. The vaulting spires of Girapur City are beacon for all manner of ambitious craftsmen and metallurgists wishing to create the most stunning inventions. This city, and much of Kaladesh, is ruled by a pragmatic and often stifling government known as the Consulate, which controls how artifice is practiced. 
Vehicles and constructs are the norm on Kaladesh. Many can be seen carrying about mundane tasks to open up more creative avenues for the plane's inhabitants. Others allow for mass and efficient transport across Girapur, and yet others created for defense of the city. Beyond the visually stunning palisades of the great cities lie Kaladesh's equally impressive natural lands, chief of which is the forest of Pima, whose verdure is indescribable and whose environs support a wide range of beasts as well as many of the plains' elves, seeking to understand the ether cycle. A realm of metal and artifice proved a tantalizingly easy target for invasion by new Phyrexia, which we see in the card Swiftwater Cliffs, whose flavor text reads, Kaladesh's wondrous inventions and glowing ether were of utmost interest to Jin Gitaxius and his chrome host. The glistening oil found purchase in many of Kaladesh's inventions, and completion of native populations sped through the largely artificial cities, which we see in Furnace Gremlin, and on the transform side of Aetherblade Agent, which showcases a consulate assassin completed into the Gitaxian Mind Stinger. Though Phyrexian assault began apace, Kaladesh gathered resources and resolve to defend itself. We see the Angels of the Plain grant assistive boons and act as a source of inspiration in the card Guardian of Girapur, whose flavor text reads, She was hope incarnate, an incandescent bulwark against the tide of machines. The Elves of Pima, who already cast off much of technology's control, also proved indispensable in forming a contingent largely unaffected by Glistening Oil's corruption, which is highlighted in the card Iridescent Blade Master, whose illustration depicts an elf wielding a halo-infused blade to bring swift justice to the invading Phyrexians. Kaldheim is a plain of myth, of heroic deeds done and memorable songs sung, a plain of Viking warriors, of mighty angels, powerful demons, and inscrutable gods. The plain itself is divided into ten realms each associated with two colors of mana, and each drifting lazily along the cosmic boughs of the world tree that connects them. Travel for mortals between the realms is impossible, but the gods and powerful creatures of Kaldheim can move between realms and the cosmos is itself populated by myriad mythical beasts like Koma Cosmos Serpent and Sarof Realm Eater. When the paths of various realms converge, devastating Doomscar form creating a temporary and erratic bridge between them that allows mortals to venture into lands otherwise unknown to them. Kaldheim has once before been the target of Phyrexian interest when the green-aligned praetor Vorinclex arrived to steal a sample of Tyrite, the mystical and magically charged sap of the world tree for Elish Norn's diabolic ends. The Mother of Machines fashioned her engine for multiversal invasion known as Realmbreaker on the model of Kaldheim's world tree. With the March of the Machine, Phyrexia has returned to utterly destroy Kaldheim and reduce its cosmic tree to ash. The perfidious glistening oil transformed Kaldheim's mortals and monsters alike. Even the great Cosmos Serpent fell to completion, which we see in the card Cosmic Hunger, whose flavor text reads, The Copper Host sought only the strongest converts. In Coma, it found perfection. With their myths transformed, with their hopes shattered, the denizens of Kaldheim united to deny Phyrexia its greatest prize. On the reverse side of Invasion of Kaldheim, the plane's defenders immolated the heart of their plane, the tree that supported the Ten Realms in Pyre of the World Tree. The flavor text tells us that, The warriors of Kaldheim burned the soul of their world to keep it out of Phyrexia's hands. This is a massive blow to the very nature of the plane, and the resultant fallout cannot be comprehended, but the people endure. The realm survive, and Phyrexia is defeated. The memory of all that was lost is preserved in the card Tribute to the World Tree, where the god Essica states, The tree was the heart of our world. It made me what I am and pulled me back from the brink of death. I won't allow it to be forgotten. Kamigawa, a futuristic plane where tradition and progress, science and mysticism weave together in awe-inspiring harmony. It's a land of spirit where Kami are revered and present in all aspects of life, and where the mortal realm is separated from the spiritual by a thin veil that nonetheless links the two together. But it wasn't always the hypermodern metropolis we see today. In fact, our first visit to the plane occurred centuries in the past and gave a glimpse of Kamigawa's feudalistic history, where samurai defended their lord's land with honor, where parchment was the preferred mode of communication 
and where even the grandest city held numbers far below the hundreds of thousands seen today. The cultural, technological, and metropolitan hub of Tawashi is Kamagawa's beating heart. Here, all manner of vehicles take to the skies in metallic flight or zoom through the bustling streets below. As with Kaldheim, Kamagawa had once before fallen under the purview of New Phyrexia when Jin Gitaxius arrived to conduct experiments on the plane's Kami spirits, which led to the tragic breakthrough that allowed completion of planeswalkers. And as with Kaladesh, Kamigawa's technological advancement and reliance on artifice proved a boon for the new Phyrexian invaders, as corrupted constructs and glistening oil seeped into the plain. The first target for completion was the massive tree in the center of Tawashi, known as Beseju, whose boughs erupted and rained vile oil down upon the city center, hinted at in the card Corruption of Tawashi. Across the sprawl, inhabitants are converted into Phyrexian abominations, which we see in cards like Alabaster Host Intercessor and Grafted Butcher. The sheer rate of progress, ingenuity, and advancement on Kamagawa proved a boon for the plane's defenders, however, as they quickly adapted to Phyrexian invasion and developed tools to bypass the detrimental effects of corruption. We hear this on the reverse side of Invasion of Kamagawa, in which the flavor text of Rooftop Saboteur states, the pace of Kamigawa's development meant that Jin Gitaxius' intel was already outdated when the invaders arrived. The idyllic plain of Lorwyn suffers from a dark affliction that casts deep shadow over the land and its inhabitants. Like two faces of the same coin, Lorwyn and its mirror image Shadowmoor are conflicting but inextricably linked, representing different aspects of the same plane. Lorwyn represents day, light, life, and hope. When the plane shows this side, fields are heavy with crop, the sun blankets verdant landscapes, the waterways are clear and safe, and the forests hum with the songs of wildlife. Lorwyn is home to many races that have developed close-knit tribal communities. A unique and rather rare race, known as Kithkin, populate hamlets. Beyond their wooden palisades lie fertile farmland tilled by diligent workers, which we see in rustic clacken. The merfolk of the plain are known as marrows. They tend Lorwyn's riverways that meander across the plain, centered around the Wanderwide hub. The fiery elementals known as Flamekin sojourn from Brighthearth and bring knowledge of pyromancy as seen in Brighthearth Banneret. Lorwyn's elf population is obsessed with the beauty found in perfection. They ruthlessly hunt all that infringe on attraction, which we see in Eyeblight's ending. And the nefarious clique of fairies prowl about, pulling all manner of dangerous pranks. A bizarre phenomenon known as the Great Aurora sweeps across Lorwyn every 300 years, transforming its vibrant landscapes into the grim, fearful haunts of Shadowmoor. The Aurora's magic transforms the very nature of Lorwyn's denizens and wipes clean their memories of the lives they once led. Shadowmoor represents night, darkness, despair, and caution. The friendly Kithkin have become xenophobic and isolationist, turning into themselves for protection. The Marrows have turned cruel, resorting to treachery along untended riverways. The Flamekin's fires have burnt out, reducing them to smoldering cinders. The Elves now seek the light and ride to the rescue of all that is beautiful in a grim world. Only the Fairies remain unchanged and continue their devilish pranks, which we see in the card Fairy Swarm, whose flavor text reads, Untouched by the aurora, Una's fairies greeted the night like any other day. With the invasion of New Phyrexia, Glistening Oil and the effusions of the Argent etchings found vulnerable hearts on Lorwyn, especially among some of its elvish population, who were already engaged in pursuing perfection. We see this in the illustration of Completed Huntmaster, and hear it in a flavor text. The elves of Lorwyn sought perfection. The etched host supplied it. But Lorwyn's creatures proved well suited to combating the sinister host of New Phyrexia. In the card Fertilid's Favor, we see an elemental project an aura of protection against corruption, the text of which clues us into their innate power. The denizens of Lorwyn were accustomed to resisting darkness. And the imminent threat of an external conqueror united the various races of the plain in a manner never before seen. On the reverse side of Invasion of Lorwyn, we see the elves of the forest fighting alongside creatures they would consider despicable in the offensive winnowing forces. It tells us that the Phyrexian appearance was so offensive that Perfects and Eyeblights worked together in unprecedented kinship 
to destroy them. The glamorous carousing found within bustling new Capenna belies the plane's dubious past. Long ago, Capenna fell under threat of invasion by minions of Yagmoth's old Phyrexia. Besieged on all fronts in fighting a losing battle, Capenna's angels' mere presence proved enough to hold Phyrexian legions at bay, but insufficient to win victory. Witnessing the power of the Archangel's aura in weakening Phyrexian armies, Capenna's demons betrayed them, leached their essence, and distilled it into the mystical substance known as Halo. Halo proved a boon and allowed survivors to escape Cataclysm, ultimately founding lustrous new Capenna behind its shielding magic. Their history forgotten, Phyrexia not even a memory, the city of New Capenna is now run by five demonic criminal families, each focused on acquiring Halo as the substance acts as currency, embodies power, and confers all manner of mystical ability. The Obscura, presided over by Sphinx Rafine, control information, plot assassinations, and carry out disorienting subterfuge against the other families. Falco Spara leads the Brokers, a band of corrupt lawgivers financers, and swindlers extorting the masses for what they consider protection. Conceited and vain Xander and his maestros claim the most discerning taste in New Capenna, acquiring priceless paintings, attending theatrical shows, and hunting down victims with only the most exquisite blood. The raucous cabaretti care only for a good time and Halo continues to flow from their debauched parties as long as Jetmir remains in power. They host the most lavish parties of New Capenna and in the sweltering forges of industry, the laboring riveteers ensure the engines of the city run smoothly, protect another, and fight dangerous turf wars culminating in dragon fire from their implacable leader, Zeatora. Capenna's history with Phyrexia and the presence of Halo prove paramount in the plane's struggle during Elish Norn's invasion. Norn knew the strategic significance of Halo in combating the glistening oil and her corrupted machines so sent 10,000 troops under the leadership of Atraxa Praetor's voice to crush the city's defenses and destroy its supplies of Halo before the substance could be used against her. We hear this in the flavor text of Bloodfell Caves. Having learned of New Capenna's Halo supply, Elish Norn dispatched Atraxa herself to bring the world to heal. The Phyrexians corrupted many denizens and completed countless, including a majority of maestro vampires, which we see in the card Iker Drinker. Unforeseen by Norn, Capenna's ancient angelic defenders returned from centuries in obscurity to lend assistance to the city. We see this in the card Errant and Giada. While the mortal inhabitants weaponized Halo to vaporize monstrosities born of glistening oil. This is illustrated in the reverse of Invasion of New Capenna, where a holy frazzle cannon blasts radiant waves of mystical energy. These two factors led to New Phyrexia's defeat on Capenna and the death of Atraxa, which is illustrated in the card Atraxa's Fall. The plain-wide city of Ravnica is a sprawling metropolis of great renown, held in tentative balance by ten guilds under whose auspices the city is shepherded. Each guild is tied to a combination of two colors of mana, and the code in which they conduct themselves has been mystically bound into a document of irresistible law known as the Guild Pact. Ravnica's guild consists of the blue and white aligned Azorius, bringers of law and order, the blue and red aligned Izzet League, masters of spellcraft and unexpected explosions, the blue and green aligned Simic Combine who experiment on nature to evolve its greatness, the blue and black aligned House Demir who acts in obscurity to limit the influence of any one faction, the white and red aligned Boros Legion, zealous upholders of justice and the armed forces. White and green aligned Selesnia Conclave, who seek peace through community and unity with nature. The white and black aligned Orzov Syndicate, masters of debt, coin, and political intrigue. The black and green aligned Golgari Swarm, who rule the undercity of Ravnica and tend rot to promote natural cycles of life and death. Black and red aligned Cult of Rakdos, a sadistic band of nihilists and demon worshippers and the red and green aligned Gruul clans who lead tribal bands in the lawless rubble belt and command inexorable beasts of nature. Ravnica has been riven by interplanar conflict in the recent past with the War of the Spark, a multiversal culmination of Elder Dragon Planeswalker Nicol Bolas's dark machinations. The damage left in the wake shook Ravnica's very foundation, 
but the city endured and even grew closer from the conflict, celebrating their victory together as one in the card plane wide celebration. But before the plane could recover completely, Elish Norn's invading factions broke through the blind eternities to once more plunge Ravnica into a grueling fight for survival. In the illustration of Realmbreaker's Grasp, we see the invasion tree's destructive tendrils immobilize a Selesnian elemental. And in the card Mutagen Connoisseur, we see a member of the Simic Combine voluntarily completed by New Phyrexia's glistening oil. Its flavor text reads, Much to the Phyrexian's delight, sheer curiosity drove many to willingly surrender to completion. But Ravnica isn't without its defenders. The Ten Guilds have united once more in face of an extraplanar threat to protect their city, and even the magic of the Guild Pact has mobilized forces in Ravnica's defense, which we see in the card Guild Pact Paragon on the reverse side of Invasion of Ravnica. Although not depicted in this set, Niv Mizzet, once the draconic leader of the Izzet Guild, stands as the living Guild Pact and commands earth-shaking power to crush New Phyrexia's invading forces. Powerful maelstroms surge violently across the landscape of Tarkir, from which fully formed dragons burst forth to satisfy their burning hunger. The dragon is so symbolic of the plane, can be found coursing through the sky in the furthest reaches, and the cultures and civilizations that cower beneath its wings and melt under its breath have largely been shaped by it. But Tarkir was not always so. In the distant past, the dragon had died out, the maelstroms quieted, and the beast faded into myth, its bones and memory the only remnants of what had been. From this vacuum of power the clans of Tarkir rose, each ruled by a great Khan, each affiliated with three colors of mana, and each embracing fully one aspect of the dragon's character. The Teemer clans were led by Surak Dragonclaw and lived in the harsh, unpredictable frozen tundras of the frontier. Their warriors and shamans revered nature and represented the savage claw of the dragon. Monks seeking enlightenment and wisdom through solitude established isolated monasteries and mountain redoubts, founding the Jeskai Way. They were guided towards understanding by Narset, enlightened master, spending days, months, years, lifetimes seeking the ever-elusive answers to life's mysteries. Though contemplative by nature, Jeskai were also bellicose warriors and embraced the dragon's cunning. In the blinding deserts of Tarkir, where the land itself works to erode, only through community and solidarity can one survive. The Abzan houses dominated the shifting desert sands and fostered a clan of interdependence and shared growth, headed by Anafenza, the foremost. The Abzan's flourishing against such hostile environs is symbolic of their endurance and of the shielding scale of the dragon. On the rolling plains and expansive plateaus, one is vulnerable to all of Tarkir's danger. Only speed and savage aggression can work against such forces, and these ideas are wholly embraced by the Mardu Horde that gallops across Tarkir's steppes, led by Zergo Helmsmasher. These warriors, brigands, and looters embody the wings of the dragon and its speed, delivering swift and decisive strikes to unsuspecting foes. Deep within Tarkir's steaming jungles are hidden the vile machinations of the Soltai Brood. Ambition and ruthlessness color all interactions of the brood, who seek personal advancement at any cost. They embody the fang of the dragon. Tarkir's past was twisted and rewritten by fate when planeswalker Sarkhan Vol stepped through time and diverted the course of history forever. In the new rendition, the dragon never died out, but continued to surge from invigorated maelstroms and mystical storms. The dragons organized themselves into five broods, each directed by an elder dragon then waged war on the Khans and their clans. In the ensuing Khanfall, the dragons usurped power and history from the Khans. Their communities were obliterated and integrated into service of the broods, their history forgotten. In the current day, the five elder dragons continue to rule, but they have now been subject to external threat with the invasion of New Phyrexia and the corruption of the glistening oil. The dragon, ever a symbol of might and aggression, couldn't withstand the Phyrexian oil, and many of Tarkir's dragons were completed, and the dogma of the dragon lords replaced by the whispers of perfection, which we hear in the flavor text of Burnished Dune Stomper. Your precious dragon lords repressed your instincts, Kerr. You were born a hunter. 
evolve, and hunt again. The five dragon broods, normally at odds with another, realize the threat Phyrexia poses and have joined together to melt the invaders in Dragonfire. We see and hear of their efforts in Stoke the Flames, which shows shamans guiding burning flame and reads, The Atarka shamans rouse the fire into a scorching rebuke of the invaders and a beacon of hope for their survivors. A pantheon of gods seated within the starry realm of Nyx presides over their mortal supplicants in the physical realm below, and beneath lies the underworld, ultimate destination for all who dwell on the plain of Theros. Theros is a land of myth made manifest, ethereal ideals and inborn passions given birth to physical forces. It's a plain where faith and devotion yield tangible fruit, and the gods, the creatures of Nyx, and the horrors below are all given power through mortal belief. Fifteen gods preside over Theros, their own vanities, foibles, and predilections shape their character, and each seeks personal ambitions outside the purview of the others. To win power, Theros' gods command the devotion of mortal followers. They grant boons to disciples worthy of their praise, and smite unbelievers who have stirred their fickle ire. On the mortal realm, great civilizations have been erected, hubs of enlightenment and trade the likes of Miletus, centers of martial strength such as Akros, Havens of verdure replete with bower passages, the likes of Sitessa, all in worthy reverence and devotion towards the gods. Mortals seek glory and favor in life so that they might reach the fabled paradise of Elysia and complacently dwell for eternity. Those who lived an uninspired life or one twisted by corruption are doomed to languish in the tortured reaches of the underworld forever. Since Theros is a plane where belief wields true power, Elish Norn and her invading Phyrexians began their corruption of the plane by twisting devotion of its mortal denizens. In Alabaster Host Sanctifier, a devoted follower of the sun god Heliod has had her mind warped to perversion and the flavor text reads, Heliod shines his light on all things, excising the shadows of doubt. Rejoice, for beneath his purifying eyes, Theros is united as one. A more alarming result of Phyrexian's insidious encroachment is seen with the completion of Heliod himself, which we see in the card Heliod the Radiant Dawn, and its reverse, Heliod the Warped Eclipse. The flavor text tells us the sequence of Phyrexia's conquest. Complete the faith, complete the god. Complete the god, complete the plane. Heliod's scorn is then cast on the innocence of the plane, which we see illustrated in all its horror in the card Sunfall. But Theros isn't without its saviors. Though many of the gods slowly succumb to completion as their mortal worshippers are corrupted, Ephara, god of the polis, remains a staunch defender of all Theros. We see this on the reverse side of Invasion of Theros and Ephara ever sheltering. Her flavor text is a grim intimation to the completion of Theros' main gods. When the sun falters and the seas disperse, when the wilds wither and the forges go cold, when death itself succumbs, she endures. Outside her own personal might, Ephara bestows knowledge of the damaging godfire to assist Theros' mortals in spurning Phyrexia's advances. We see this illustrated in Urn of Godfire, whose flavor text reads, Ephara blessed the defenders of Theros with godfire, a Nyx-infused incendiary substance that burned without fuel. The volatile plain of Zendikar is filled with both wondrous adventure and dangerous follies. Its landscape is unpredictable, its creatures are ferocious, and it demands constant vigilance from all expedition parties braving the elements to plumb depths of ancient ruins in search of relics from ages past. Zendikar pulses with raw primordial mana, coursing through untethered ley lines and supporting all manner of flourishing growth. Its disparate continents abound with varying ecosystems, landscapes, and creatures, but a uniting feature of the plain is the presence of the royal, a magical and temperamental maelstrom that rolls across the landscape. In its wake, settlements are upended, forests are felled, grasslands are cracked and broken, and volcanoes erupt in sulfurous billows. Extreme weather, floods, earthquakes, and general tumult caused by the royal leave Zendikar largely untamed and unpredictable. It is, in fact, an extension of the plane itself, 
a defense mechanism initiated when Zendikar was met with its first invasion by a deadly extraplanar threat millennia ago. The Eldrazi Titans, three beings of immense power and filled with insatiable hunger, whose sole purpose is the consumption of entire planes in a grand feeding frenzy. Twice, the inscrutable race nearly ate Zendikar to oblivion, but with the assistance of planeswalkers and the land itself, the people endured. Now Zendikar faces its second extraplanar invasion from Elish Norn and New Phyrexia. The invasion of the plane was spearheaded by the completed core planeswalker Nahiri, a native of Zendikar, who wishes to break the plane to its core in order to rebuild in a grand vision of what it ought to be. This is seen in cards like Shatter the Source, and Nahiri's Warcrafting, whose flavor text reads, Zendikar must be broken before it can be saved. But Zendikar is not a plane to go quietly. Even though the elemental incarnation of the plane, Omnath, has been corrupted beyond redemption, Zendikar's soul is as obstinate and willful as ever, and the royal is a force not even Phyrexia can contain. We see this in the illustration of Vengeant Earth, whose text reads, when Zendikar's defenders faltered, the royal rose up to shake the invaders from its back. And again, in the flavor text of the card, Rugged Highlands, which highlights the destructive potential of the royal and reads, The royal, Zendikar's plan-wide immune system, rose in full force against the threat of Phyrexian infection. So ends our tour of the greater plains besieged by Elish Norn and her various factions of new Phyrexian invaders and the majority of the planes in the known multiverse. Thanks so much for watching and listening, but now I want to hear from you. Let me know your thoughts on the planes discussed, which one you want to see more of, and suggestions for future videos in the comments below. And if you're a fan of lore and storytelling, be sure to subscribe to the channel, listen to the podcast, or check out the blog where content is uploaded frequently. A huge shout out to all of my patrons over on Patreon. Your support means the world to me and helps the channel grow and improve. If you're interested in becoming a lore luminary for access to me, early video drops, written scripts, and more, check out the link below or head to patreon.com slash the lorebrarians to learn more. Until next time, go forth and explore the lore. <laughs>